Hi, everyone. Hi, Philip. Hi, Philip. So um, for, for those who, who don't know Philip, um, he's the last speaker for today. Uh, it's Philip Schmidt, and he's a machine learning engineer and the tech lead at Hugging Face, where he leads the collaboration with the Amazon SageMaker team. So if you have any questions about SageMaker um, in the next couple of days, just post them on the forum, and I guess Philip will help you there. Um, he's also really passionate about democratizing and productionizing cutting edge NLP models and improving the use of them for deep learning. And today he's going to explain to us how to do managed training with Amazon SageMaker and Hugging Face Transformers. Um, so I think here we're going to actually see um, how to push models to the hub, which you know most people I think are interested in learning so that then they can use those models for building their spaces. So I'll share the, um, the video and then we'll come back for a Q&A. Hi everyone, my name is Philip. I'm the tech lead for our collaboration with AWS and Amazon SageMaker. Today, I'm happy to talk to you about managed training with Amazon SageMaker and Hugging Face Transformers. I will show you in a few minutes how you can train and automatically push your Hugging Face Transformer model using Amazon SageMaker to our Hugging Face model hub. For those of you who don't know Amazon SageMaker, Amazon SageMaker is a fully managed machine learning service that provides everyone with the ability to build, train, and deploy machine learning models quickly. Let's get started. Um, I already started uh, Amazon SageMaker Notebook instance, which is like a managed Jupyter environment by AWS. You will get access to the notebook, um, I guess, through some resources. It's on GitHub, so you can find it pretty easily. In the beginning, I included a few links, so we have several um, resources and documentation about how to use Amazon SageMaker with Hugging Face Transformers. We have a special documentation. We have um, a lot of examples. We already did a few workshops over the past uh, couple of months. Maybe some of you have been there. And then we have a dedicated SageMaker section in our Hugging Face forum. So if you are participating on the community in the next couple of days, feel free to ask any question you have in this community forum sections. Okay, let's get started. So what we are going to do is we are going to train a multi-class text classification model using transformers and datasets, of course. And as dataset, we are going to use the emotion dataset. And as model, we are going to use the distal bird uncased. The first step is, of course, we need to install our dependencies. In this case, we are using the SageMaker package, which is the SageMaker Python SDKs to interact with the SageMaker platform behind the scenes. Then we have transformers and a datasets version to pre-process our dataset. Since I have renders already, I have my dependencies installed. And then um, we can jump into the next section, which is permission. So, um, this notebook can be run inside of AWS using Amazon SageMaker notebook instances or the SageMaker Studio. Then um, SageMaker provides a nice way to get access to permissions. So if you want to run your training on SageMaker, of course, you will need permissions to um, access your data on S3 or to start your training job with the correct instance type. Since we are running inside of AWS, I can execute a call cell, which um, basically gets our permission role, gets our S3 bucket, which we will use to store our training assets, and then the region we will run in. If you are going to run or want to run SageMaker training or training jobs um, from your local machine or from a virtual machine or basically from anywhere else, um, there's also like a cell encoded you can uh, comment in and um, then yeah, basically get access to the same resources as I am. To start our training, um, we of course want to pre-process our data set. And what's very nice about Amazon SageMaker is that um, we can split up pre-processing and training into two different parts. And then for example, only um, or have the pre-processed data set already available when running our training. So what we are going to do is we pick up our tokenizer, um, pick up our emotion data set, and um, pre-process it um, using data sets um, to yeah, our preferred format. So we are loading the data set, we are tokenizing it, we have like a small little helper function for it, and then we changing the labels and um, setting the format for our columns. 
And then what we are going to do is we are going to leverage the S3 file system integration into data sets, which basically allows us to save our pre-processed data set to Amazon S3 to then later use in um, our training job. So we don't need to pre-process our data set again um, when running the training. So that's pretty nice. So we can upload our data set, which um, is then um, the error file created by the datasets library as well, the SD configuration files. After we have uploaded it, we can get like to the nice part to create our estimator and start our training. The hugging face estimator is um, yeah, basically a Python class, which includes all of the um, nits and grids you need to start your training. So when we scroll down a bit here, we can see the hugging face um, estimator, which says, okay, we want to use our train.py script. Um, it, it is located in our scripts folder. We want to use a P3 instance, which has uh, NVIDIA GPU mounted. We want to use one instance. So if you want to run distributed training, you can easily change the number to two, and then you can leverage multi GPUs and multi nodes. And um, we have the name, of course, for our job, which will be used to look into um, the results afterwards. We have our role, which we got in the beginning to have access to our um, data sets we have uploaded to S3. And then we have uh, our image, which is basically the container where transformers and PyTorch or TensorFlow data sets is installed, which will be used for our training. We have a Python version and then the hyperparameters. And the hyperparameters are parameters we can pass into our training job. So you can imagine that when running a training, SageMaker will start a EC2 instance, which start, starts our container and then executes um, our training with Python free, in this case, train.py, and then provides the hyperparameter we define here as CLI argument. So the key would be the key in our argument, and then we have the value. So the training script we are going to use has an arcs parser included, which accepts all of our training parameters, and then this can be used inside our training. Since we want to push our model to the Hugging Face Hub, we can um, use the Hugging Face Hub notebook login and then provide our um, yeah, required hyperparameters to push our model to the Hugging Face Hub, which is the push to hub um, argument, of course, then the model ID of our new created repository. When we want to save our model, since we are running like one epoch, um, I guess it doesn't make that much sense to save every, but if we are going to change it to free, then um, the trainer would save after each epoch our model to the hugging face hub and we can like directly interact with it. But let's keep it for now with one so the training will run faster. And then of course our hugging face token. So we can log in. That's my username. Copy my password. Hit login. And we are logged into our account. We set our hyperparameters, we create our hugging face instant class and get an error because we forget our comma here. Create our hugging face estimator. And then what's nice, so to start our training, we can run the dot fit method. And you are probably aware of that we have pre-processed our data set inside our notebook and uploaded to S3, where we defined um, variables to the location. So our data set for the train is saved in this S3 location, and we can now provide um, the S3 UI into our um, estimator, into the fit method, and then SageMaker will load before the training starts the data set from S3 into our um, environment, and we can access it directly from the file system. So we can start our training with executing the cell. I intentionally um, provided a wait false method uh, which tells the SDK to not wait until the training job is done. If we would um, remove it, then SageMaker would basically connect to the EC2 instance and we would see the, um, yeah, the command line, the output of the training job, the logs, everything directly inside of the notebook. But since we provide our token, um, I guess it's better to provide faults and rather look up the training job in the management console. Additionally, you, I have a, a waiter script, which basically um, checks if the training job is done so we can execute it and then the cell will be completed after our training job is finished. And then we can access our model by um, running this nice little code, which yeah, dynamically creates our um, 
eigenface URL with our username and then the model hub ID we provided earlier. And then if we jump into our model page, um, I run the training already. The trainer and SageMaker has created a nicely model card with our accuracy and the loss. We can see, okay, which model we have trained on which data set. Um, we can see the hyperparameter, which we have provided um, using our hyperparameter dictionary. We can see our training results. We run it for one epoch. We have the framework version, super nice. We can run the inference directly since it's already on the inference API available. Yes, we can while it's loading, check it into our files. And here we can see basically everything is correctly saved by our training job and by SageMaker. And we can share the model with our friends and then they can use, can use it. Perfect. And then afterwards there's a, yeah, like a visual on how SageMaker works. You can like look into it to understand a bit better What's happening, but the easy way is basically we have a hugging face deep learning container or training container, which includes all of our libraries we need. We have our data set on S3. And then when, when starting our training job with the SDK, StageMaker will start our instances, pulls the DLC, runs the DLC on the container with our script, loads our pre-trained model from the hugging face hub, loads, loads our data set from S3 and then runs the training. And at the end, you can also save it to S3 and then deploy it directly with SageMaker, but we like cut it a step and saved it to the hub and then use the inference API for it. And then additionally, I have provided a nice little example on how you can use and leverage already existing training scripts. So I guess you are familiar with the Hugging Face Transformer repository. And in there, we have an examples directory, which includes a lot of scripts for a lot of different tasks, including NLP, vision, speech, and all of those scripts are compatible with SageMaker. So to use them, SageMaker provides a Git config where we can point to our GitHub repository, to which branch we want to use. And then we can basically run again um, our estimator and run the training job and then the example script will be used directly from GitHub and you can or only need to provide the hyperparameters and don't need to write your own training script if there's already an existing one for your use case. Thank you for um, listening. I hope to see you all in the community event in the next couple of days. If you have questions about SageMaker or run into some issues, feel free to contact me and looking forward on what you will create. And we're back. Thanks for that nice talk, Philip. It's uh, super welcome. cool to see that you can push your models to the hub by kind of using the same uh, parameters in the trainer, um, just the hub model ID and the name, it's super cool. Um, speaking of that, we have a question which is, does the SageMaker estimator leverage the trainer from Transformers? Um, so maybe, how, how is the training being done? Is it did you did you reinvent the trainer? Uh, yes. <laughs> no. Um, it, like it really depends on what like flavor of Transformers you are using. So Mathieu, in like the talk before, for example, used mm -hmm. um, TensorFlow and Keras, and for this you would like need to use the um, Keras callback we have for the Hugging Face Hub to push your model to the hub. In my example, I use PyTorch and then of course the trainer. So it's like, uh, yeah, a normal Python training script. You could like run outside of SageMaker on your local machine with, with like the parameters. And then with the nice integration from the trainer into the Hugging Face Hub, we just needed to provide our like token and the hub, a hub ID. And then we were able to push it like automatically. I think one thing we should say and people need to watch out is that if you are running your training in SageMaker in an air gap environment, so you could also configure like VPC configuration that um, your training don't has internet connection, then of course the integration with the hub wouldn't work. But I, get, I expect since we are like an open community and share everything with everyone, um, we are not running training inside um, air gap environments this week. Cool, cool. So another question is, um, can I do hyperparameter search with SageMaker? Um, and if not, what would you suggest someone does if they want to find like a good learning rate, for example? Yeah, so there are like 
two different ways you could do hyperparameter search um, by using SageMaker. So the first way would be using the SageMaker SDK and the SageMaker like features. So SageMaker supports something called uh, automatic um, hyperparameter search, I think, where you can um, define um, like um, hyperparameter space and provide this hyperparameter space to your estimator. And then SageMaker will automatically run multiple training jobs. So um, in our, like on my example, I provided the hyperparameters. And in addition to this, you can provide like the hyperparameter space. And then SageMaker will start multiple training jobs and keeps an eye on, OK, which metrics um, I'm going to track and do I want to maximize it or minimize it. And But you can also like go the open source way and create a training script using Optuna, Ray, or whatever optimization tool you want to use, and then either um, run a longer training. So you could add like a loop inside of your training script to run like multiple iteration experiments, and then like save them to the hugging phase hub or add like uh, early stoppings into it. Or you could like um, provide multiple hyperparameters and then loop your estimator to start multiple training jobs. Cool, cool. So I'm going to ask you a personal question I've been asking everyone else. Um, so, yeah, in your bio, it says that you're like the tech lead at Hugging Face for the SageMaker partnership and also some other projects. You know, what, what does a, a day in the life of uh, Philip look like at Hugging Face? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, I'm from Germany. Uh, this means like um, I have um, a lot of my meetings are like in the evening or like late evening, I would say, since AWS is in the US mostly. So, my normal morning is starting catching up on Slack and everything happened during the night since we're like a global company and then working on some tasks. And normally I go into uh, or working out um, before um, lunch and then have like a nice lunch break. And then in the afternoon I have like all of those nice meetings with AWS people or like with the hugging face around the world. And then that's basically it. Cool. But I, I would and, say and, like, and what kind of, sorry, please. Yeah, I think I would say like, uh, Every day is like something new and you need to be very flexible. So you cannot say, okay, I want to do like this for the next five days. You like always need to adjust to the needs and what currently is important to do. Cool. Cool. And, and I also know you do a lot of work on like productionizing like machine learning models or like making them faster or smaller and essentially all this crazy optimization stuff. And I was kind of curious to hear your thoughts on like, you know, one, why, why does this matter? Why can't I just, you know, train my model and call it a day and two where do you see uh, like the sort of most kind of exciting developments in this like space of optimization of transformers yeah i think like so you could of course use like your vanilla model you have created but there are like always two kind of leverage you could use the one is maybe your model is too slow to run inside of your product so for example search is like the best use case for it if I'm like a Google user, I want to type in and want like my get result immediately. And I cannot wait like a few hundred milliseconds or even seconds to get my search result because then I would start using Bing or like DuckDuckGo or like some different search service. And the other leverage is of course, the smaller the model, the less compute you need to use and the less like money you need to spend on. And if you, for example, if we take a look at GPT-3, which I think is around 400 gigabytes or something, or you need to have like at least a dozen GPU to run it, which is like way too expensive for startups. And then if we take a look at a new uh, T0 plus model from the big science um, yeah, organization, which is I think 16 times smaller, which also means 16 times less expensive than running GPT-3. And I think to be able to give everyone access, we the models need to be small enough or cheap enough to run so people can use it. I mean. Nobody helps it that uh, a model can solve any task if you cannot use it. Yep, yep, definitely. And and um, I'm just wondering, like, what are the um, sort of uh, challenges that happen when you want to make these models smaller? Like, is it just like pip install optimized model, um, or is it uh, more complicated? Yeah, sadly, it's more complicated, but like we are getting closer to just running hey, optimized model X or model Y. Um, but it like it really depends on the model architectures you are using and then also on the task you're using. So for example, sequence to sequence models are way harder to optimize since you have a lot of dynamic into it and you have like the encoder model and the decoder model and it's like it's not static at all. 
And if you want to optimize or like the easiest optimization step is basically to trace your graph or basically to know in advance what computation you want to do. So dynamic models are way harder to optimize, but I think we are making good progress or like the whole deep learning community is making good progress to making optimizations easier and more accessible. And I think in the future, we will see a lot more of this. And I mean, like Optimum, the new open source library is, I guess, one of the best examples on how to leverage optimization, optimization techniques um, for yeah, transformer models. Yeah, so for those who are interested, um, Philip is referring to um, the Optimum library. So let's find it. Optimum. And um, do you want to just tell us in, in a one minute or 30 seconds what this is about? Um, yeah, I can give it a try. I'm like not the expert in it, but Optimum is basically, uh, you could see it as an additional layer on top of the Transformers library for every like optimization for a specific hardware provider, which doesn't fit into like the normal Transformers uh, repository. So as a uh, like best example, I would say we can see a graph core IPUs, which uh, requires some changes to the trainer and to the like training loop. And those changes were implemented into the Optimum library. And then Optimum again is compatible with Transformers. So you can use graph core IPUs to train your Transformers model using Optimum and Transformers. And we don't need to worry about breaking things inside of Transformers just for the uh, IPU use case. Awesome. So let me just have a quick look at the forum. Um, let's see if there's any last questions. Okay, so there's one more question. Um, this is maybe more of a, an AWS question. Let's uh, just chuck it in the banner. So the, the question is, can we make assumptions uh, or comparisons between the GPU instances that are available for this project on AWS and what a regular sort of CoLab GPU offers? So I guess the question is like, you know, I, I think Mathieu mentioned that we have like P3 instances and uh, maybe the question is like, if someone wants to use CoLab themselves and maybe pay for it with CoLab Pro, you know, do you, what do you see roughly as the price differences there? I think it's hard to compare since like CoLab is like a managed Jupyter environment and what we are going to use with AWS are like these virtual machine and instance types. So um, you can use them for the SageMaker notebook, which I've shown in my talk, or you can use them for the main training we run and you can like scale them up and are like not limited to the GPU you get when starting your call-up environment. So you always know, okay, I want to use the NVIDIA A100 for my training, or I want to use four NVIDIA A100 for my training because I want to use or to run it just in a distributed way to be faster, to iterate more and to achieve better results. And I think it's hard to compare a, a like apples with like strawberries, I would say. And it really depends on what you want to do. And it, it would be unfair to compare like a collab as a, like a, as a free service with mm -hmm. uh, cloud um, subscriptions because they bring way more than just your managed environment. I mean, in collab, I don't think you can like easily collaborate and have permissions across your organizations or make sure that people can do certain things. Yep. Yep. Totally but agree. definitely for for the um, like the community um, event, you can like type in Google uh, EC2 instance type, and then you should find like an AWS documentation page where you can search for P3, and the P3 um, to spoil you um, it supports a um, Tesla V100 GPU, and um, like the smallest one has um, 16 gig of memory, and then the G4, which Mathieu mentioned, is an NVIDIA T4 Tensor Core unit. So both GPUs are pretty good, I would say. And I guess better what you get with Colab free for now. So you should definitely join the community event to test them. Nice. With that, I think that's, there's no more questions. So thank you once again, Philip, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you around in the next couple of days on Discord or in the forums. Awesome. Bye.